morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think you heard a little bit about me, so I thought maybe I should know a little bit about you. Um, what would be a good question? Um, how many people here have CD players in their car? Show of hands, please. CDs, CD players, not too many. How many of those actually using those, the CD player? <laughs> Two, three, four, five, maybe. Very, very few. Who doesn't even know if they have a CD player in their car? Who doesn't care? And I'm sure that some of you are young enough to even know, not even sure what the CD player is, right? So the point is, organizations offer, suffer from major myopia. They really don't know why they're developing certain features. If, if nobody uses CD players in cars, why are we still putting them in cars? Why are we wasting expensive resources, designing them, testing them, putting in the dashboard, and so on? So, your organization is very likely suffering from major myopia. They don't really know what, what happens to product once they are sold. Once your product is sold, is installed, is in the field, you really lose touch with it. You don't even know how it's being used, what features you do that you worked so hard on are being used versus those that you thought were not important and people love it. Where do customers have difficulties with the features that you, were, again, worked so hard designing? You really don't know enough about your products. One of the few areas or the few portals, if you will, remaining is customer service, hotline, field service, whatever you have for your organization. And usually when you hear something then, it's in forum bad news. Customer complaints, warranty claims, field service records, and so on. And in all likelihood, this um, myopia set on much, much earlier in the process, where products were developed using old, you know, stale, out of touch requirements from the customer. They don't really know what the market needs, and therefore you based your features on, on, um, on misconception of the market is. No wonder so many products are failing. And you know, you see many statistics where the 80% of products fail, only 70, only 25, it doesn't really matter. Most products in the market fail. And most of the startups fail because they have no understanding of what the market requirements are. And you can read the, the chart, it's really not important specifically, other than the fact that most of the product fail because there's lack of understanding, there was myopia as far as what the market really not needs, what the customers really wanted. I'm sure that many of you have you've been to many startups before, you've been part of a startup. I spend most of my time when I had kind of real job uh, in startups. Uh, whether it was true startup or startup building a new, a new division for a company. And we often use these, these examples, we use this these, um, explanation why we failed. We are ahead of the market. What kind of stupid argument is this? If you're ahead of the market, that means you did not build your product to the market. It's really the most lame excuse I hear from startups. We're ahead of the market. The market does not understand our products. If they don't understand your product, that means your product is wrong, not it's not the fault of the market. So I. I'm here to suggest that we've been doing this the wrong way. We've been going the wrong way about developing products for a long, long time because, again, we're basing our product assumptions and customer assumptions based on old, stale, very often biased observation of the market. Now, I know that many of you have been to innovation workshops uh, and, and you know, market research, and you all heard about the funnel. You all say that, but the funnel that we need Sorry, it's the wrong funnel. I, I gotta give you the right depth of funnel. Funnel. You know, you know the idea of you we collect ideas, we vet some of them, they go through a process, then we continue refining them until few good ideas come out and potentially these are used to create a product. I maintain that using the funnel literally, and I bet most of you do use it literally the way it's defined, is described here in the chart. Um, is, 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 is the wrong model. Because what happens is, once an idea gets in the funnel, it doesn't leave. I mean, some, some of them go out, but there's no feedback, there's no understanding of the market throughout the process. And true, some products go through the process very, very quickly, so it's okay, but if you think about more complex products, cars would be one of the more extreme examples, it takes year, years from, the end, from a product or an idea entering the funnel until it comes out. And all the, during this period, you again, you have no understanding of the market. You're totally myopic to what's happening in the market. 
new technologies perhaps you need to, uh, to consider, uh, competitive market has changed, um, the landscape has changed, so you may want to partner differently. You lose, you, you create these walls that are not allow, do not allow you to really understand your product again. So the myopia continues. It starts very early in the process, continue through the funnel, continue through the deployment, and we're totally oblivious to what's really happening in the market. Again, no wonder so many products failed, certainly many products disappoint at the end, and no wonder at the end customers find creative solutions to CD players. So we use CD player as a holder for an iPhone. Why not? That's a great idea. So I want to talk a little bit about the Internet of Things and, and put this in the context of what is really a good product? What is, the, what is the way to find the killer app? What is the killer app in the Internet of Things or in the context of Internet of Things? How do we go about avoiding at least or, or reducing some of the myopia? An example that I like to use when I talk about IoT is, is the following. It's a bit off on purpose but it really gives you a good idea what the IoT is. So this is the high-speed train that runs in Spain between Barcelona, Malaga, and uh, Madrid. So the, this car was manufactured by Siemens, and I'll come back to this in a second. But the important thing is that when you buy a ticket to ride this high-speed train between these th three cities, you get a money-back guarantee. What the guarantee is, is that if the train is late to arrive, not to depart, to arrive. By more than 15 minutes, you get all your money back. That's a very, very strong statement of confidence. This is a very strong statement as far as service level. Now, you think the company is going to lose money because trains, by definition, are always late. So getting this as, an, as a concept is kind of dangerous. But what Renfe, the Spanish rail system, did is also has a contract with Siemens, the manufacturer of the trains, and the company that maintains the trucks, the tracks, and the, and the cars. And this contract is stated in terms of uptime. So we have two contracts, one between Renfe and their customers, stated in the terms that the customers care about. And that's the key point. Terms the customer cares about. And what do customers care about? Arrival time. Now, at the same time, there's another contract between Siemens uh, and Renfe, and this contract is stated in, in different terms. The statement, the terms there, the service level there, is uptime. So the idea of the Internet of Things is really coming together to form an ecosystem of partnerships that deliver services, deliver outcomes in the way the customer expects them. Since this um, system was put in place, most of the traffic between these three cities moved from airlines, from, from airplanes, uh, to the train. It used to be that most traffic was in airplanes. Now I think that 60 plus percent of the traffic between these cities is using the train because we're offering the customer an outcome that they're expecting. So it's always about the outcomes. The whole notion of Internet of Things is defining outcomes in a way that we can measure and, and deliver. And the best way to really paraphrase this, and it's really a nice quote from Theodore Levitt, who was at Harvard Business School for many, many years, customers or people do not want quarter-inch drill bits. What they want is holes. And think about it. It's very, very it's simple. It's kind of a little bit tongue of cheek, but it's very profound. We don't want the tool. We want the outcome. And this is why when I talk about the Internet of Things, I really don't talk much about the Internet of Things as much as I talk about the outcome economy, and which is also the book, and I think Megan mentioned the book that I wrote on the topic. So the Internet of Things is really about having connected devices, connected assets, connected systems that enable new business models. They enable new customer engagement models. As we said earlier, Renfe defined the outcome not in terms of the way they look at the product, but rather they define it the way the customer wants to look at the product, i.e. arrival time. Those customer engagement models drive or deliver user-defined outcomes. It has to be stated in the terms of the user, in the user outcome, not in my term as the service provider or the product provider, but rather the way my customer wants to look at it. And very critical, it's typically de de um, delivered by an ecosystem. Most successful IoT implementations, certainly going forward, will not be delivered by a single vendor or single platform or a single service provider, but rather by an ecosystem. And we just discussed it. 
in the case of the Renfe story, the, the Renfe use case, the ecosystem is Siemens and Renfe working together. And by the way, since then, the other providers, the other trained providers for uh, Renfe, such as Alstom, have the same contract. So it's really not a Siemens thing. It's more like the way Renfe looks at delivering service in an environment where everything is connected. So that's really what it, what it is when we think about the Internet of Things. It's about everything and everyone is connected. And this really allows us to look at very, very differently at, at the product, at the outcome, and measuring the outcome and measuring customers. But it's really not only connected products. It's really about connected customers that are as important. So when I talk about the Internet of Things, it's not on, uh, only about physical stuff, but rather it's also about connected customers. And connected customers, customers today are all over the place. As it turns out, users of products, and then this is true for both consumer-level products and even commercial and production products, are always connected. They're always looking for the internet for advice and for help. It's amazing how often customers will go to the internet for seek advice about technical problem before they call your hotline. They will go to chat groups. They will download patches from people they never heard of from before. They don't even know them, but they don't put patches. And they often do this before they call your hotline because they don't want to be talked down at. They don't want to be on hold. And, and honestly, very often, these people on the internet are more knowledgeable, at least as knowledgeable as your hotline, and they are as willing to help, maybe more so than your hotline. So no wonder everybody goes to the internet. And when they do this, of course, they don't miss an opportunity to tell everybody about what they think about you and your product. So it's an opportunity now they get advice, but also tell everybody what, you know, how is your product, how is your service, what is the brand, what is the image of the brand. So in the world of internet, consumers or products are connected, consumers are connected, and consumers become sensors. So IoT is about connected products and customers or users or whatever you want to call them. It's not only about telemetry from one device to the, to the cloud. That's a very, very limiting way of thinking. We need to think about the Internet of Things as everything and everybody is connected, and they continue to talk to you about, you know, to the world, about your product and about your service. So the IoT is really a way to maybe think, go back uh, probably 15, 20 years ago when we talk about the real-time enterprise, when we talk about the need to get information quickly about the state of the enterprise, the state of the product, the state of manufacturing, the state of your customer service levels, and so on. So the IoT, by definition, is a way to shorten latency of information. So it's all about knowing everything about your product and about customers as soon as they happen. And this really drives the way we look at the organization going forward, the way we look at organizations that are driven by the Internet of Things. And it goes all the way to innovation. I spoke earlier, spoke earlier about the innovation funnel, right? About how we need feedback from the market to feed into the, um, into the innovation funnel and get better insight, deeper understanding about your, our, our customer base or future customer base. So in an IoT-driven organization, always connected product and services are the ones that drive the innovation. And they provide immediate feedback, continuous feedback, <coughs> about the product, and it's from a diverse group of, of customers, of the users, or of an ecosystem, rather. It's customers, it's my supply chain, it's my partners, it's my service and content providers. It's a very diverse ecosystem that continues to provide this feedback. And it really allows us to go much, much faster, much more precisely through design iterations. So it's no longer this endless funnel that we enter and we don't leave it until it's, it's at the end. It's really about getting quick, iterative, precise feedback on the, on the design. And I'm not looking at this the way I look at agile development. It, they're related, but it's really not about agile development. It's about having continuous understanding of the market. What's happening there, what's the feedback, and so on. And you can do this through development. You can do it when the product is launched, but you get feedback to improve current and future product revision. So it's really not that it's not really the agile development as much as the entire product life cycle um, that we need to look at. We need to look at the total life of a product, not only development phase. And this really allows you to kill useless features, 
CD players. Who needs a CD player in the car if nobody uses it? And most of you don't even know if you have one in the car. Uh, and it helps us improve those unutilized features, those that we thought were so important and so critical, but we have no idea if people use them or not. Other than, again, if we get um, a complaint or a warranty call or a field service record indicating a problem. So to me, the IoT provides the largest, best, always there focus group. So we move the focus group from early in the process to throughout the product lifecycle. Very often I see a situation where they, there was a focus group at some point when we entered the funnel, but it took forever to get these results into the funnel and continue working the, on them. And in the, in the meantime, things change. Outside stuff changes, competition, technology, and so on, but also inside. Politics can always kill very good ideas and so on. So now we move the focus group away from the early phase to the entire product lifecycle. And this is really, really powerful way of looking at the benefit of always connected products and services. That really requires us to change the organization. We really need to stop thinking about transactions. We need to stop thinking about operations, but think about customer-centric models. How do we look at the customer every time we, we look at the feature or we look at the design or testing and so on? And it's really not about customer-centric as much as the mindset of the customer. It's not about yeah, you know, this is great user interface. It's really about are we delivering the outcome the customer wants? Are we delivering on-time arrival? Are we delivering uptime? Are we delivering holes? Going back to, um, to the, the example I gave earlier. So it's really moving us from being reactionary to warranty claims and to complaints and to this guy on the internet complaining about our brand to making decisions based on evidence, based on what we're seeing from the market, what's working, what's not working, what's accepted by the market or what is not. And that's kind of easy to say, but it really requires us to move away from functional silos. You know, I'm in marketing, and then I'm in design, and then I'm engineering, and then I'm in, if I have a physical product, in manufacturing, then I'm in field service, then I'm in warranty management. No, we need to move everything up front. We need to front load many of these decisions. And we're unable to do this until, other than again, we talked about this when we spoke 20 years ago about the real-time enterprise, but now we can actually do it. And even if we don't do it, we get it. You know, this guy in the middle of the night on the internet will send us his feedback whether we like it or not. So it's really a really major change to the organization. And it's not going to be easy. It's really not going to be easy. It's very easy to define theoretical models. It's very, very difficult to work against a culture of the organization. As Peter Drucker said, you know, culture is strategy for breakfast. We can come up with the great ideas, but organization structure and culture um, natural human resistance to changes, and you know we've been doing this this way for the last 50 years. Why change? Fighting against those is going to be very very difficult, and I'm not suggesting that we can just do it as a result of being a good idea. And and you can see what happens. Some 50 percent of companies either say or they feel uncomfortable saying no, um, but about half of them are challenged. They say they're challenged by their board and others to, to go some sort of digital transformation, connect the enterprise, create the digital backbone, create this internet of things, if you will. So again, I, I think the number, this number may be um, not exaggerated, but maybe kind of off, because it's not only the board. Everybody talks about it. So if you're in converse, CEO conversation, you don't feel comfortable saying, I've never heard of it, I'm not doing it. But about, also about 40% or 45% are doing it. So they are in early stages of, of implementing some sort of digital transformation. The irony is, the difficult part is that only 17% are in, a, they've already proved the concept, they have the structure, they have some initial architecture, they're scaling the, the, the digital transformation process. They have an architecture, maybe they move completely to the cloud, maybe they have an IoT solution, but only 17% or so are scaling and mere 3% are saying, we've proven the value, now we're building up, now we're seeing the value, we're harvesting the value, we're building up. Very, very few of the organizations do that. Because it's difficult, it is really difficult. And a huge part of the difficulty, in addition to the culture, is really that the old way of building IT architecture doesn't really support that. The IT that we, you know, some of us grew up on and some, some of us inherited are really, really extremely rigid. 
They deal with fixed workflows, so we know transactions have to move from one point to the other. Reports have to be structured in a certain way. It's very, very rigid. And part of it is because we, ha we are dealing with known participants. So this workflow goes from one point to another, from this information producer to this uh, from this producer to this consumer. And it can be within the organization, can be in the supply chain, but we know the actors, we know the participants. But in the IoT, as I described earlier, it's really an ecosystem of participants. We need to onboard and offboard partners that we never had before. We need flexible structures that allows us to do that. Therefore, the governance has to be flexible because governance mechanisms in one business domain or one geography or one set of uh, workflows doesn't work anymore. We need a way to provide uh, flexible governance. And that really means that we need to do away with the silos. The problem with IoT today is that it follows the, the, the silos. And it's a very, very long discussion, but I think that what's happening is that we have silos and IT systems tend to mimic the silos because it's easier to implement. But by doing so, we're enforcing the silos as opposed to doing away with the silos. And of course, we have inertia because, you know, 20-year-old companies have been doing this forever that way, so why? You know, why change? It's much easier to continue. So the current approach to IT, the current approach to IT architectures, is not going to work anymore. It's just not going to work. We're not going to be able to provide the flexibility, the agility, the openness that we need to provide the foundation for this complex, diverse, dynamic ecosystem that we must have in order to deliver um, an IoT-based solution. So this really requires us to think much more in way of platforms as opposed to think about how do we connect devices, how, how do we deal with data security and privacy, even how we deal with analytics. That's not the question. The question is, what is the platform we need to base our, our architecture on so we can provide this flexibility and agility? And a platform, to me, is much more than a piece of software. It's not an integration platform. It's not like you know, a set of a, uh, APIs and some workflows and, 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 and so on. It's really something that allows me to provide this adaptability that changes continuously to align itself with the business, uh, business models and governance. It's really what allows me to experiment continuously. So I have a prototype, or I have an early product, I can immediately get sense the market and respond to it and continue to change dynamically. So a way to think about a platform, IoT platform, any platform, is more than a piece of software, more than integration API, it's really a place. It's a place where ecosystem partners come together. So therefore, they onboard and offboard dynamically. Therefore, as I said earlier, we need to provide um, flexible data management governance. We need to deal with data privacy and data rights on top of data security and so on. So this is what a platform does. Um, I want to kind of leave you with some thoughts about what will happen in the future when it comes to IoT and hopefully the view of the future and what we discussed so far will help you get to where you need to be. So you, you read all these reports, you read all these predictions, by year 2020 or pick any year, there will be 20 to 50 billion connected devices. And my response is, who cares, really? First of all, the numbers are kind of off by, you're off by 20 or 30 billion. Gives you a sense that many of these analysts have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, seriously, I mean, they, they will say, well, we count differently. At the end, they have no idea what they're talking about. But for most of us, it doesn't really matter. If you're AT&T, you care. If Intel, you care. If you are Qualcomm, you care. But most of us don't care. So forget about connected devices. Totally unimportant. The next point about um, what's going to happen is that I think that we will find that big data and machine learning, all these newly, not, not newly invented, but revised you know, or reused um, terms are uh, going to pre prove to be much harder than people think. You know, I grew up on the previous wave of AI, so I, for 10 some years I built AI applications. This was a previous wave. And it's a it's very, very difficult task. A lot of concern about, you know, algorithmic difficulties, uh, issues around privacy, it's difficult to do. What will drive the future is ecosystems, and those that will win will be the ones that use platforms that enable business agility. Those that really think about the outcome-driven organization and not about the features and functions. Think about the outcomes, not the features and the functions. And this will really what will lead us to the outcome-driven organization. We require new thinking, new thinking that allows you to really think of your customer engagement models, how to generate, how to use these for new revenue streams, and 
use this thinking to change the product development process. No longer the funnel, but rather a dynamic view of the market and continue to use this ever-going, um, ever-present focus group. And this will hopefully, if you use those and use data correctly, will allow you to make better um, product-related decisions. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm very happy to... Thank you. Thank you.